Hello, everybody. I think we're ready to start. Um, I'm Federico von der Palen from the University of Antioquia in Colombia, and I will be your host today in the Latin American webinars on physics. Today we have a very interesting talk about the recent 750 GV diphoton excess at the LHC. Uh, we're followed live by several people, by Alejandro Lafuente, de la Puente, um, Nicolás Bernal, Roberto Linero, Sven Heinemeyer. Um, but before we start, um, don't forget to ask questions via Q&A in Google Plus or via Twitter with the hashtag LAWOnPhysics. Now we have a WordPress page where we will centralize all the information in the webinars. So uh, the speaker is Gero von Gasdorf. He's a professor at the PUC in Rio, in Brazil. He obtained his PhD in physics at the U, uh, Autonomous University in Madrid, and um, after that went on postdoc appointments at the Johns Hopkins University, CERN, Ecole Polytechnique, and the ICTP in Sao Paulo. The title of his talk is Light by Light Scattering and the 750 GV Diphoton Excess. So, Gero, now I pass the word to you. Okay, so can you hear me? Yes. Thank you very much. So let me uh, thank you very much for this um, um, invitation to give this webinar. Um, yeah. So um, so my title of my talk is uh, Light by Light Scattering and the 750 GV Diphoton Excess. This is uh, work. Uh, based uh, on uh, two papers, recent papers, together with uh, Sylvain Fichet and Christophe Royon, these two um, preprints. And so let me remind what all this is about. Um, so um, recently uh, there's been some uh, um, report of an excess in the diphoton mass spectrum of um, uh, at ATLAS and CMS, at uh, this excess, what you can see here, occurs at uh, 750 GeV. And uh, in the first uh, three or so uh, interspent back one of data at the, uh, at the run two. And this has con uh, uh, generated considerable interest uh, in the in the HEP communi community, and uh, maybe <coughs> maybe some of the reason of this is that there has been some kind of déjà vu here. If I might show the analogous plot of the um, of the of the Higgs uh, in the same like photon channel, with a little bit more of data, so the same thing appeared very early on in the. Uh, in the, in the diphoton channel as well. So, um, of course, uh, the Higgs was very well motivated and searched for this was com this completely unexpected. And, of course, the significance here, uh, almost four sigma, uh, however, this is a local significance global is, is, is of course, less. Uh, the exciting thing is that the CMS also sees some kind of uh, excess here, a little bit less of, uh, of data. But they also give a, a combination with the ATV data, and so uh, the, the excess uh, is almost uh, three sigma uh, local. And so this has uh, generated, of course, a lot of excitement. So uh, and a whole tsunami of papers. So of course, experimentalists always say statements like, "Ah, oh, that's not very significant, looking at the global numbers of one point something sigma." Fluctuations come and go. Uh, we look forward to more data, and the Warner's theorists do not take this too serious, seriously. But of course, this message was completely lost, uh, and there were like in the first two months or so after the excess that was reported in the mid December, at the end of the year, there was uh, up to up to now there are some 200 papers on just this topic. So there has been a lot of uh, excitement about this. Now, um, just a few corner stones, a few numbers to remember. Uh, what I will, I will, I will assume for now that there is such a resonance. Call it phi, and um, uh, ignoring all these statements by the experimentalists, and uh, the, then the properties that you can extract from this excess are, the, are, the, are these, these the following. 
So the excess is both seen in the Atlas seen at around 750 GB mass. Um, Atlas also reports the best fit value for uh, for the width, which is uh, is larger than the resolution of the um, of the of the of the detector. So um, it's a 45 GB, fairly in the well, intermediate range, I would say, six percent of the mass. The cross section, uh, okay, depends a bit on the efficiencies uh, that depend on the production channel, but the um, the, the rough number to keep in mind that it's about a 10 femtobar uh, sigma times branching ratio. And of course, being a gamma gamma channel, there's no uh, electric charge. Now, um, there are some further implications that one can uh, make with very mild assumptions or almost no assumptions. So, first of all, uh, we know that it cannot be spin one because of the uh, uh, Landau Young theorem. And uh, the simplest possibility then is spin 0, spin 2. Let, uh, for the rest of this talk, I will focus on spin 0. Spin 2 is not so different in many respects, but uh, for the sake of uh, for being concrete, I will assume that spin 0. And it has to be a, um, a, it has to be a singlet under, under electromagnetism, and it could also be singlet under the full standard model um, electronic group. In this case, the UV-complete theories imply the presence of other new particles. Almost, uh, that's almost a, a, a immediate consequence, and that's probably also the reason why this is so, uh, has received so much attention. And the argument goes as follows: So we have this, for instance, this diagram here, where this 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 resonance is produced in gluon fusion in this case, and decays to gamma gamma. And so, for instance, this gamma gamma decay has to come from some dimension five interaction, which is non-renormalizable. So uh, in a in a in a in a renormalized well, theory, it has to be uh, has to be produced has to be uh, generated in, in loops. And in this case, uh, standard model uh, fields cannot couple at all to, to such a neutral resonance because standard model is chiral. And uh, and so there has to be some uh, new physics states, um, which is a fairly generic prediction if uh, that photon excess is real. So there's there's a lot of attention to uh, given to this fact, and many people have tried to to build UV complete models, perturbative models, where this coupling here in this diagram is generated um, by some new physics, uh, motivated or not. Okay, so um, let me come to part one of my talk, which is um, uh, photon fusion production. So um, so what, is the what are the possible production modes of such a resonance? So the first obvious thing to think about is gluon fusion. In this case, you would start with such an effective Lagrangian here with a photon coupling that I already showed on the previous uh, page, and a glu analogous gluon coupling. Then you can write down such a, um, a, such a production uh, cross-section here. The other possibility is, of course, that it, uh, it's produced in quark fusion. Um, uh, and the third uh, uh, possibility that I want to focus on is the possibility that it's produced in photon fusion. It's kind of the minimal scenario because you don't need any other couplings. And since we already know that the, that the coupling of the photon must be there because we observe it in the diphoton channel, uh, it could be an interesting question to ask: Is this possible with only this coupling? Okay, and um, so. This is um, the focus of the first part, and of course, one comment should, I should say here: these these red and green couplings, uh, so the photon and the quark, they have to be made. Uh, if this is if this is a D, for instance, a standard model signal, we have to we have to put um, appropriate um, uh, powers of the Higgs field to make this SU two uh, times. Um, uh, um, times you one invariant, and then of course this become not dimension five, but dimension six, at least dimension six operators. But for the purpose of this talk, this is not so important. Um, okay, so um, so the question then is: Is photon fusion a realistic possibility? And this question, I think, should be broken down into two uh, two parts. Part one. So let's assume first of all, let's assume that we have only this effective Lagrangian. 
So part one uh, is then the question, what is the cross-section in terms of this effective coupling? So this is a completely well, model-independent question, a module of this assumption, of course. Um, uh, so then one can one can compute this cross section term at gamma and 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 then compare to the excess and fit from the excess at gamma from the data. So that's the first part that, uh, of this question in the in the in the in the title of the slide. And the second uh, one is more model dependent. Is how can this such a coupling then be generated? Uh, the size of this coupling that we found in, in, in that we will find here from this first part. Um, how is it? Uh, how is it generated from new physics, and is this in particular, is this Yukawa coupling here that appears, is it, uh, can it be in the perturbative range? Okay, so can we generate perturbatively such a coupling uh, that is written here on the top? Now, um, the um, cross-section, uh, we have computed in this paper, and there have been some uh, there have been some other papers after after us uh, that did the same thing, and so what we find is the following. Um, so we find, uh, in terms of this coupling f gamma, in terms of the width uh, capital gamma phi, we find a cross section of uh, a few factor one if this f gamma is of the uh, of in, in the five GB region, and indeed the uh, the width is at. 45 GB as referred uh, from Atlas. Now, um, there are some numbers here that I don't have probably much time to, uh, to explain in, in great detail. But um, this, these, are, these are related in principle to the, uh, to the, to the way that we, um, that we um, compute this, this, uh, this cross-section. Um, and, uh, we use uh, some other old results in, in, um, in similar processes, and in, in a sense, we, we adapt the analysis uh, or the computations in order to fit our in order to fit this um, process. So there's, I don't have the time here to go into detail what these factors are, but this, uh, what's important is that they represent some of the theoretical uncertainties in, in the computation. Uh, of our, of our way of computing the cross section. So you can see that there's some kind of, if you add these up, some, some, something like 40% or so theoretical uncertainty, which is quite large. And if you go to this paper by Harlan Lang, Cause Risk, in the second one here, you can find some uh, more, um, uh, say, um, up initial calculation of this, of this cross section. And there, the, 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 the theoretical uncertainties are much smaller, but the uh, Within the uncertainties, this is a correct result. Now, um, so another important uh, point concerns the uh, uh, the, the compatibility with the HTV data. So HTV did not see any excess, any significant excess. And uh, so the question is, can this be compatible? And the answer is yes. So uh, both us and these other people find a roughly a factor of three. Uh, between the 13 and 8 TV cross sections, which makes them uh, roughly compatible within the within the errors. So this is uh, uh, this is one thing. So now we know theoretically what such a cross section should be, and um, so then we can compare to the excess and make a fit. And this is the the result. So in green are the 68 uh, percent confidence confidence level. Uh, um, Result and then in red the 95 percent, and here also on the right I present the the, the, the corresponding uh, cross section. Um, of course, you see that the so this is just with the experimental uncertainty here, uh, but of course you see one important thing, which is that the um, that the um, um, the the error in f in this coupling f is um, is quite small, much smaller than the error in the cross section because of this power of four here. So whether we know this cross section uh, to very good accuracy uh, or not, already uh, in the level of the coupling, this becomes a very precise uh, prediction. So roughly speaking, what we need uh, for the excess to be um, produced just from this photon fusion. Uh, 
production mechanism uh, is that this, this coupling F uh, is, or the coupling was 1 over F, so this F is, in a, is, is something of the order of 4 to 5 TV, okay? For, I remind you, a mass of about 750. So this is already quite a narrow range for, uh, given the, uh, the low statistics here. Now, um, so the second part uh, that of, of the question that I mentioned on the previous uh, transparency was, uh, can we perturbatively generate such a, um, can we perturbatively generate such a coupling uh, of 4 to 5 TV? Is that realistic? And the answer to this is uh, we can, and this um, um, we have done with a very simple model. We introduce n vector like uncolored fermions, uncolored because we do not want to generate the gluon coupling in our case, of uh, electric charge Q and mass m psi, that are three parameters. And uh, the other three parameter, of course, is this uh, Yukawa coupling between uh, this. Um, this field phi and these uh, vector-like fermions. So these are new vector-like fermions uh, um, that have a, that can have a, a mass term in a standard model. These um, can be motivated by several new physics scenarios, uncolored naturalness, etc., which I don't have time to go into. And then compute simply uh, this this diagram here, and this of course a well-known diagram. So we can just uh, read the result off from the literature, and adapting to our parameters, and this is what we find. Um, uh, the important thing here is that, uh, so what we can do with this result is we can fit, uh, fit we, can, we can look what parameters can be compatible with the excess from two sides. For one thing is, of course, the, the total cross-section, the other one is the total width. And so this would fix two combinations. Of course, there are still two parameters left, so there are, it's in total there are four parameters, Q, N, the mass, so the, the charge, the multiplicity, the mass, and the Yukawa. So there's, at this point, uh, no way of com completely pinning down this model from just this measurement. But uh, one can, in principle, um, sorry, one can, in principle, um, 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 Figure out some sample uh, values for the for this model and see whether this is in the in the perturbative regime. And the answer is this can be done. Um, the uh, it requires that the charge is fairly large. So this is a particular choice that works. Uh, moderately large electric charge, uh, low multiplicity, um, the mass close to the um, with a um, kinematic uh, limit, where you have a little bit of phase space suppression because uh, otherwise you would um, overshoot with the width, and uh, and, uh, and the cover coupling of lambda. So and if you if you translate this into, I hope you can see this here with a stupid message. I don't know how to get this away. Um, so this is roughly still perturbative. Uh, if you take as perturbativity the the uh, criterion that the top coupling lambda times square root n is smaller than 4 pi. Okay, so this is kind of a sanity check of, of, the fa of, of this model. So, so the question, the second question that we wanted to know is, is, this, is it possible that, uh, is it sensible such a UV theory uh, generates the, the diphoton excess just uh, from photon fusion? Now, let me come to um, Part two, which is a little bit um, related, but also uh, conceptually a bit different, so that we contrast the two things uh, to be completely clear what I am trying to do in this uh, second part. Um, so previously, um, <coughs> uh, I assumed that only uh, the phi gamma gamma coupling was present and the phi blue blue and phi quark quark couplings are either vanishing or sufficiently suppressed and then we determined uh, this coupling from the excess. Now in this, this other part that comes now, I will make no assumptions on the couplings or the production also that it's 100% model independent, can be completely non fusion, can be completely quark fusion, etc. And ask the question, is there a way to measure the phi gamma gamma coupling 
in the future uh, runs of the run of LHC. And so to answer this question, let me remind you a little bit on uh, on on, two, on on a detail here that I skipped previously. Uh, so there's in principle um, <coughs> two two classes of production modes: the inelastic and the elastic. In the inelastic, what happens is that the proton it's more the common case. The proton they collide, get uh, get broken apart, and don't remain intact after the collision. And this is the dominant uh, uh, production mode that was also, for instance, uh, the, the um, that was also the uh, at the base of the of the, of the previous uh, calculation that I just showed. So there was this diagram in particular here. However, there is a subdominant mode, which is uh, when the when the protons remain intact after the collision, is I call elastic production. And there is something uh, interesting here because uh, so for the for the gluon case, this is um, highly suppressed, right? This is so. First of all, notice that here you need to have a, an ex extra exchange of gluons in order for the, for the proton to uh, to to avoid that you extract color from the proton, so to speak. While for the for the for the um, for the photon, this is completely tree level, and then there are some other subtleties. Uh, why, why, why this diagram is, is, is much more suppressed with respect to that diagram here. And so we find for the gluon a power factor of five order magnitudes. For the photon, however, it's only one order of magnitude, right? So this is a, <clears throat> this, so this subdominant uh, uh, process is something that one can look at the LHC. Now, first of all, so I will from completely neglect this uh, this very small contribution to gluon fusion from the elastic uh, case, and now there, I'll show you that there is a way of um, of getting rid of all these diagrams in the first line and concentrate on the last uh, uh, process here, the elastic photon fusion process, and that will allow us to accurately determine this coupling F gamma. So, and this is going goes under the name of proton tagging. Uh, proton tagging makes use of um, of forward detectors um, that are installed um, or in in the in the in near the Atlas and CMS detectors, and the idea is the following: so for such elastic event, the protons that will collide will be slightly deflected, and they can be detected at detectors forward detectors uh, along the beam line a few hundred meters away from the main detectors of Atlas CMS. So you will have a central event here in the detector, and at the same time, you will measure the intact protons that come out from this, from this uh, hard collision, uh, elastic collision uh, in, the, in the detectors. And then you can, you can, what you can do is you, you match the kinematics of the protons and the kinematics of these events in the, in the central detector, and you can completely suppress all the inelastic events. They can be completely rejected, and the, the pilot is completely under control because you can match the kinematics of the forward detectors and the central detector. And um, so, um, so this is essentially background fee. Standard model can also be completely removed. So these detectors are already almost uh, Working at CMS at least, they will be taking data in a, few, in a couple of uh, in June, June or so. They are a, a plan to be installed or already being installed. I'm not quite sure in Atlas as well. So this is something that will that will deliver data very very soon. So so and then going back to these diagrams. So what we can do is with this we can completely reject uh, these diagrams here. Uh, the inelastic uh, production goes without affecting much actually the, the inelastic ones. Okay, so so then one can compute. So this allows us to okay, of course, looking again at this diagram, this this cross section can be measured, and then one can fit to this coupling, which is the only coupling which appears in this process. The only unknown coupling which appears in this process. So. Um, so and and again, one can uh, compute this. In this case, the elastic cross section. This has much less theoretical uncertainty, at least in our calculation. Also, the uh, uh, it agrees very well with the other uh, papers. 
And this is what we find. You see here, there's about, remind, remind you, for the same parameterization, we had about 5 femtobahn in the inner staircase, so roughly an order of magnitude or so uh, we lose. But this channel is extremely clean and has no background. And so this helps very much in the, uh, in the, in the analysis. So, um, so, so then what you can, what you can do is take this and you, you plot this against, uh, for instance, this, cu this coupling or the inverse coupling is a, is a function of the number of events. And you can see with, uh, with, with, with um, we can, you, can, you can put the error bars here with just a Poissonian error bars and you can read out what are the sensitivities that you can have at the, for instance, the 300 inverse family bar of data of the LHC. So this would be this, this purple blot, this purple error bars here, which come from, um, from, uh, from assuming 300 inverse family bar. And so the, <coughs> the, um, the, the accuracy is fairly good. Again, what helps here is this, this power of 4 that reduces a lot the error bars of the coupling with respect to the error bars of the cross section. And of course, if you have a high luminosity phase of the LHC, you can go much, much larger. You can also ask yourself, so if I don't, um, if I don't uh, observe anything, so what are my, uh, so that would be this 0 here, what are my possible, uh, ex what is my possible exclusion power on this coupling, and these are the numbers that we found. So roughly speaking, of the order of 10 to 15 TV at the 300 inverse femta barn, um, uh, after 300 inverse femta barn of data. And of course, with high luminosity, this, this gets pushed to, to higher values of, of, of F or equivalent to smaller couplings. Now, um, so then let's plot this and compare this to expectation uh, um, for this um, for this for this excess. So what I plot here is the photon and gluon coupling. Notice that this is this again the inverse coupling read. So the the the, high, the the large coupling region appears at the lower end of this axis. So this is the gamma. And this is the blue. And so the, 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 to the right and upper corner is the weak coupling region. So then you can have this the blue band. Sorry, this purple band here which will be the preferred region for the diphoton excess at, uh, at uh, width of 45 GV, OK? And um, so then we, we have in blue here, that's the region of, uh, that's excluded by run one digest searches. Um, this is, of course, excluding the large coupling, the large gluon coupling region, which is the lower end of this x-axis here. And then the, it, this is the exclusion bound that I just showed uh, um, from, uh, from elastic photon-photon uh, fusion at 95% and 300 inverse femtobar. So we can go up to something that was this, uh, 11 GV I showed on the previous transparency. And so this is the... Um, this is the region that we can here exclude from this measurement. Of course, this is kind of uh, uh, conservative. So if you go to a higher luminosity phase, you will both increase the bounds of on uh, from uh, from the gluons, sorry, from the digest search. So this blue band will move to the right, and this red band will move up. And uh, so you basically can almost cover the whole range that is of interest from the photon excess, which is this uh, purple band here again. So I'm almost done. Um, so so that's what I just said. So important points that digest surges and this elastic photon fusion are of course complementary because one more or less measures the gluon coupling, the other measures the or is sensitive to the photon coupling. And more bound, more data will improve both bounds and basically one can uh, uh, one can um, cover the whole region. So now um, the same can be done. So this is almost the same plot. It can be done for, 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 for quarks. So this is just to, to show that we have done this. And um, so this is actually um, more or less what I wanted to, to show. So let me, let me conclude. So the first part, so Atlas and GMS found a very intriguing, intriguing excess in the photon mass spectrum. 
at around 750 GeV that was uh, has really triggered an unprecedented avalanche of papers on that pH. Um, a lot of interest still uh, two months after this, there are around two papers a day on this. Um, <clears throat> So we have, we have uh, the first part, we have uh, worked under the assumption that only couples this, this, this new resonance, putative new resonance, con, uh, couples only the photons that computed the cross-section and fitted it to the excess, uh, and showed that there are some simple renormalizable models of uncolored fermions that can generate this, uh, this coupling perturbatively. And then in the second part, Independent of any production mode, can be mainly muon fusion, mainly quark fusion, or even mainly photon fusion. Um, <clears throat> we have shown that the photon coupling can be measured in elastic events by completely suppressing any inelastic events with uh, using using proton tagging. So we have only we are only left with uh, elastic uh, photon fusion. And this is a background-free, uh, basically background-free and pilot-free. Um, okay, the pilot is of course there, but it can can completely be rejected. Um, uh, way of, of looking at this, and uh, so this makes it makes it a very powerful technique to to precisely measure this coupling. So we have very good sensitivity to the left photon coupling, and uh, importantly, this is a complementary way to look at this. At the, uh, as well, it's complementary to bounds on digit searches, which mainly will cover the large gluon coupling region. So that's all I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Kero. That was Kero live from Rio. Rio. So now so it's time. Now it's time. But, but before, before, well, I want to remind you that you can ask can questions, questions for Q and A in Google Plus. And also on Twitter using the hashtag LAOW on physics. Okay, now I'll pass um, you, Gero. Are there any questions from the audience first? Uh, yes, I have a question that I would like to address to, to Gero. Uh, so, one question is basically if with this type of analysis, you can also extract information for the for the effective coupling, which is the the production of Z photon. I mean, kind of since there is no excess in that channel, maybe you can figure out the the properties of this new scalar also. Uh, Gero is mute, by the way. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, got it. So you can hear me now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay. So. Um, so yeah, of course. This this we have also a small section in the second paper on. So in this in this uh, this, this elastic events, one can also have different final states. One can have uh, ZZ, ZZ, gamma, W. You can even look at jet jet. And so this gives also a, uh, a way of of of, uh, of looking at this. Of course, in these channels, one can one also has um, a lot of data from the from the inelastic. So the question is whether this is uh, this, this is really uh, um, uh, you say um, uh, competitive. With the, we have not done a detailed analysis, of this. but in principle, these these channels should be should be looked at. And of course, I, one thing I have completely skipped is, of course, I always wrote the effective coupling to 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 um, uh, to. to to photons, of course, this comes from two operators with an effective coupling to um, to two um, uh, Ws and two to uh, hypercharge gauge bosons. Of course, there is a free parameter of the relative uh, importance of the two to, uh, after the gamma coupling is fixed. So there is there is some some freedom there. But uh, yeah, so one can in principle use use these measurements that you measure that you mentioned to, to solve, for instance, the, the question of how much of this operator comes from WW and how much comes from the new Okay, thank you. But just, I mean, another very uh, fast question. I mean, for instance, in the, in the simple ultraviolet model, UV completion that you make, uh, for instance, you have that in principle you can adjust this excess in the, for masses of these extra fermions of 360 GeVs. Right. So I was wondering if 
also these particles you could produce it in the NHC. I mean, in the same process, like you have photon photon uh, scattering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this can also this can also this is definitely this can some this is something that uh, that should, that can be looked at. It's, that's one way since they are relatively light. That's one way to, to look for these things uh, to this for this particular model. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, there are some there are some. So this, since they are uncolored, of course, of course yeah, there's uh, they must be because they can be produced. Uh, uh, both on the resonance and off the resonance, no. So there's mm -hmm. there's ways to look for this. But uh, yeah, so so right now there exists very little data on this. Uh, there's some 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 searches on on the, on, on vector like leptons, but they are not very strong at this point. Okay. But of course, that's a way Can of. Can I ask a question this direction? Yes. Yes. You have these particles, as you said, relatively light which couple at least to photons and probably to the other gauge bosons uh, yes. as well. Shouldn't you also expect some effects on the electric precision data for only 360 GB? The effects could so, be large. Uh, actually uh, looked at by some people, um, precisely this question. Actually, I think I have a, uh, okay, so I don't, maybe I have a plot on this actually in my backup slides. So, um, yeah, so there's something. To, let me let me show you this plot from this paper by. Uh, by this Can we group. make them larger again? Sorry, the plots are very small, at least on my screen. Yeah, no, I'm going to make it big. Hang on, hang on. Like, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> okay, so so how can we consider? So this is a basically. Um, so you almost cannot see what's going on here. To your question, so, so this is actually a search uh, uh, how, how these, these guys can affect, for instance, uh, the gel yarn process. Okay, but you see here this very very small. I don't know if you can even see it. This comes from electric position tests. Okay, so so there is even for relatively low masses, there's not so much um, um, effect on electric position tests. But the main effect comes from uh, or the main constraint then comes from modification to, to, to drill yarn, okay? So basically the running of the, for, the, for this is here, these guys, by the way, so this is paper by Gross, uh, Christian Gross, Oleg, Lebedev, and uh, also Miguel No. Uh, and they um, they look at this process and they also look at electric position. So the electric position are kind of sub leading here. So but the, the running of the hypercharge gauge boson can 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 be can be can be can become important in, uh, in especially if, uh, if after the 300 percent of one of run two. And uh, yeah, what else? Um, so yeah, just to explain, it, this is the mass of the of the resonance, and that's essentially the multiplicity times Q squared the charge. And it's the number of the copies or families or whatever. Exactly, the number of these these fields that are also called n, and they call it here the hypercharge. It's the case where they assume they come in. in to uh, okay. it, so this hypercharge squares just Q squared the mass. So essentially, what you what you constrain is n Q squared times the mass. And since since we're on the slide, so another thing that that one can do is that is actually a previous paper of ours. Um, one can also constrain n Q to the four times the mass from this diagram here. This is uh, also a very nice way again using this forward proton uh, tagging to to to. To, to isolate the gamma 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 scattering, and then one can look at diagrams like this, and you can find similar order of magnitude for for the for the constraint for the mass and the charge. But here we here we did not include the electric. But here, to your question, this little I don't know what color this is, really purple, brown. This is electric position, and it seems to be something. Yeah. Thanks. I have a question. So, if you have this vector-like uh, leptons, just yes. like in the case of vector-like quarks, these vector-like leptons will mix with the uh, would they mix with the uh, standard model leptons in any way? In particular, so we have the assumption there. So, this is of course it, it, the important question when you want to look for um, for the decays of these guys, no? So we have not made any assumptions for the, on that in this case, but in principle, in most models, of course, you will have some some mixture there. So then they will decay into a lepton and the W or whatever the charge is, no, whatever can be done. 
Yeah, because then then the T and S parameter will depend strongly, or or so that the constraint on the mass will depend strongly on how much they mix. So you have to suppress the mixing. Yeah, that's that's absolutely correct. Yeah, so this is uh, for in particular if you, if you if you think of you know compositing models where you have some some mixing typical case now. So, but yeah, in these models typically the um, the mixing is small because the mass of the leptons is kind of small. And my last question is: Can you comment one thing on um, how would the uh, standard model quarks uh, fuse to produce this? Um, this scalar, what kind of uh, UV completion would that? Has anybody worked on this at all? Because so just you mean standard model quarks in loops? Well, you have a you 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 commented on a quark fusion producing this new scalar, right? Ah, okay, yes. So ah, yeah. So I, I don't ah, I don't know actually. Um, I, I'm sure I, I don't. I must uh, uh, full disclosure. I have not read all the 200 papers, but uh, I, I I I don't. I'm not aware of this, but probably people have. Looked into this. I'm not quite sure though. So I know, of course, people have uh, written models to generate the gluon and the the, uh, the photon coupling. But for the core coupling, I'm I'm not sure. But I'm, I'm I mean, I'm, I guess would be it has been done. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions from the audience? Hey, well, one one last one. Okay, because um, okay, so. Sorry. So, how well known these four factors, you know, for the elastic scattering, right? How how well known are they? Know how known are they for these large, such large energies, right? Because I mean, people people have figured this out at uh, very low energies, say, you know, two, three G. Oh, I think so. Since so, people have studied a lot uh, um, these these elastic case for the energies of the HC. Typically, the um, uh, the acceptance of these forward, uh, forward detectors is such that you can have about up to 1 TV photons, roughly speaking. And for this, uh, to my knowledge, it's, it's sufficiently known. I mean, at least I have not seen a discussion anywhere that, uh, that there is a major theoretical uncertainty due to uh, the fact that they are not known uh, very well. So, um, yeah, so as far as I know, it's in, within the acceptance of these detectors, which is about, as I said, about 1 TV at the 14 TV LHC. Uh, for, for until that energy, apparently, it's, it's fine. But, okay. okay, just in the wrong person. <laughs> okay, we have one question from um, the Q&A. Uh, the question is, can extra information be extracted from the photon Z, no, sorry, that's from Roberto. Assuming from Ro uh, Nicolas Rojas, assuming that in reality we have more U1 symmetries in nature, could the scalar phi spoil some other phenomenology, for instance, associated with dark photon searches or similar? Okay, so assuming that there's another U1. Um, uh, could phi spoil some phenomenology, for instance, associated to dark photon searches? So I don't know. Um, I've not thought about this, I must say. I have to think more about this. I don't know the answer, actually. Dark photon searches. Well, it depends how, I guess, depends if this, yeah, depends if, this, if, if you can generate a coupling to these dark photons, I guess, no? Uh, it's a more dependent question, I would say. So if you uh, if you have these these, these new points, if you think of a perturbative uh, generation of these these couplings, if you have a large coupling also to uh, well, if, if these new states are also charged under the hidden U1, then yeah, you might generate some some mixing, for instance, between between the photon and the dark photon, and yeah, in that case, yeah. But I, I guess that depends on how you charge these new fermions under the new gauge, the new one. But I, I, I don't know, I have not looked into this. Okay. Yeah, I have a question. It's from, from the very first part of your talk, when you talk about the cross-section proton-protein to gamma-gamma X. So you had these mm -hmm. two factors R, R, yes. S, and R in elastic. So these are guy, like uh, form factors, or? What's no, no, no. So this is, okay, I didn't have time to talk in detail. This. So the way we determined this cross section, right, was by using uh, results of uh, 
so 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 what is very well known and what we can compute very well is what of the second part, the elastic part, right? So the question then is how much is inelastic? So so there we used uh, the anal previous analysis of a different final state, and then, well, it was essentially standard model W W production, and then you get a factor of um, of the elastic over the inelastic, also the in inelastic. Uh, case over the elastic case, and that was this other. Let me get back to this slide. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so you're referring to. Oops. We're referring to these factors here. Exactly. This, so like this, this factor, as I said, just said, is this factor R inelastic. Essentially, the, the, the inelastic photon photon flux over the elastic one. The elastic one we know very well. We can compute very exactly in our case. So, and then this factor we took from this other analysis, which was uh, around the factor of 20. And then we took some uncertainty here because we're looking at the different costs. So this was this this factor here. This is just the way we computed this cross section. Okay, so using some result and something that we computed. So we did not compute the inelastic case direct. So so this gives us this uncertainty here. And the other thing related is is, is this uh, the fact um, is related to the finite size of the of the of the of the proton. Okay, so. If you extract such a large uh, energy from the from the from the uh, from the proton, okay, so there are some subtleties here that I, I, I don't want to go into, but uh, so this gives you typically some survival factor, which is something like uh, close to one in this case. And these people here, okay, so actually let me comment on this also. They have done a really very um, precise calculation of all this, but from scratch, and so there from there we can we can. We can also re-extract what these values are. So what they will find is this opening is very, it's very high side, so it was more like on the lower side. So if you, uh, if I take, if I take these values, put them in, I find something which is about uh, very, very close to what these people get up to 10 percent. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if that answers more or less your question. So this was just, in a sense, from now on, I can forget about this because one has this exact calculation here. But it is something that we put in here because of the way we computed the cross-section and um, <clears throat> and because, yeah, so because we needed to kind of uh, estimate our theoretical uncertainty from our way. So basically, the theoretical uncertainty in, in these people's paper is much, much uh, smaller. OK. So. I have another question, actually. I have another question, actually. Yeah. I think it's from the your very last plot. It's from the very last plot. Which was uh, uh, photon, photon copying. Uh, photon copying. Uh, this one, yes. Um, can you put the, the plot, please? Sorry, Gero, you're muted. Uh, how do I mute you? You have to mute yourself. Myself. I'm back. You have to mute. OK. okay. okay. Can you please okay. show the plot again? Yeah, hang on. OK, yeah. OK, let's say again. Uh, OK. Exactly. For, OK, for example, the case the, the, that you studied first, so where yes. this five so this is to yeah, the, this to the part, so this would be that the gluon coupling goes to zero, which means that the scale f g here goes to infinity. So this is this region here. Okay. Well, then so then so it's ruled out, no? No, no. This is a future projected. Uh, so we don't have this data yet, no. What it tells you is that we have complete. We have. We, we can verify the scenario with this. So this red one here is is uh, okay. future sensitivity. Yeah. So uh, yeah. It's, it's good. Yeah. So, so let me. Yeah. Start to understand. So this blue and orange region are like the region that can be tested, right? Yeah, so exactly. So, the, so be more careful. The blue region is already excluded, and the red region will be able. We will be able to exclude with 300 inverse femtobahn via this okay. uh, elastic photon-photon fusion. 
Uh, I see, I see. So, and then, okay, so that's my, and then, yeah, so you, maybe I pointed that I, I skipped because I, you know, I didn't want to anticipate the second part. So you can really um, uh, verify this first scenario, you know, whether this is a pure fault of this, because we are completely sensitive to this coupling to this elastic measurement. So if you measure something which is smaller than this, we can exclude this photon, uh, this first part, this first model. Mm -hmm. Because this, as you see, this is around f gamma. So this is f gamma on the y axis. This is f gamma between all the five TV, you know, in, the, in this blue region. Here. Sorry, this one sigma region here, four to five. So that's basically four to five that we had on the previous uh, the, the previous slides. So this is complete. So the, this measurement will be completely sensitive, uh, sensitive to this kind of uh, coupling, the size of the coupling. Okay, thanks. I have a comment, um, and maybe yeah. it's not related, to, not related completely to the photon axis, but this new proton tagging uh, thing that the LHC is implementing, it's pretty interesting, especially, I was thinking, you know, I mean, if you can produce photons like this in el uh, elastically, uh, which is basically a very background-free, uh, you can yes. probably probe, mod you can probe models of dark photons, I guess, that mix with the photon, right? Um, yes. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, you can probably do you can probably do that. So everything, uh, yeah, everything photon related. But I mean, yeah, everything photon related can basically uh, be done to very good precision there. No? Very interesting. Yeah. I, I have a question before. I mean, uh, just just very simple in the sense, uh, when do we expect that? We LHC, I mean CBS and Atlas will release new analysis on this uh, the photon excess. I mean, do we have to wait until August or one year, two year more? I don't, I don't know really, but I would expect that. Uh, I don't know in the, in the in the in the yeah. I don't know when. Maybe with Morion they will already have few now. I don't know. I don't know really what what data they have to analyze. Uh, they have data they still have to analyze, but uh, I don't know. But I mean, of course, they will. That's that's on the top of their list. If they have new data, that's one of the first things they will look into. Well, the anniversary of the discovery of the Higgs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so would you propose a 750 GeV photon-photon collider? Um, oh, I don't know about it. <laughs> that's that's first rate. What's what's coming out of this? No. So let's not get overexcited. Let's follow the the three. Uh, well, let's follow the. Caution, uh, cautious comments of the experimentalists that we should first make from our data. Okay, I see no more questions. I don't know if um, I, I have one last. Yes, please. So, Gero, when you uh, you start presenting the elastic production, uh, we're comparing the elastic versus inelastic. So you have these yes. two uh, 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 diagrams of uh, for the elastic one when you have the change of glue yes. and, and when you have uh, exactly that one. So the, when you have the gluon exchange, the pressure is like 10 to the minus 5, and the other is 10 to the minus 1. Yes. Well, what does it mean is 10 to the minus 2. So this factor refers to this diagram versus to this, versus this diagram. That's a factor of 10 to the 5 orders of input. And this factor refers to this diagram versus this diagram, OK? And well, there's, there's some reason. So, first, so it's not this versus this. Well, this depends, obviously, on the couplings, no? But uh, for instance, if the gluon coupling is extremely large compared to the photon coupling, so if you go to the well, one side of this purple band in the plot that I showed, then of course at some point this might even become relevant. But for all I mean, for most of the parameter space, it doesn't. Okay. And in the case of the gluon, you have to have a second gluon. Yeah, so this has to be because you cannot, well, if you, if you just, well, obviously, you know, if you just uh, extract the gluon from the proton, the proton will break up because the gluon carries color now, so the, pro the whatever is produced um, must get yeah. yeah, sure. So this will always happen. Uh, sorry, regarding this plot, um, I, didn't I didn't hear, I didn't understand. Um, this is something you can test in the future, or can you use uh, past data to test this? Well, this is something, since so these, these forward detectors don't work yet, they are expected for CMS, it's called uh, uh, 
to CTT, no, CTPP, CMS TOTEM is the name of this forward, precision no, proton spectrometer or something like that. And this is going to take data later this year, so something like in June or so. So this has, this is, has as, as, as I was been ta has been taught, I've been taught recently, this has been, the schedule has been a, uh, much earlier than it was expected. Now it's, we are lucky in the sense so that we can expect data very soon. And actually, for another thing, maybe for uh, if you, if you're really interested in this in this first model, that that can be tested with very let, let, very little um, with very little um, luminosity. Okay. This region here, no, this can be done with a, with a few events essentially. So, uh, with some something like 20, 30 inverse femta bar, this region can be this this region of very strong uh, f gamma can be probed very soon. Okay. Any other last questions? Um, if not, uh, we thank Gary very much. Um, I guess. Um, so I hope yes, Federico. Uh, yeah, it seems Alejandro wants to have a, or no? Yes, please. No, it's fine. I was just wondering if there is a any 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 slight difference in your analysis if it's a pseudo scalar rather than a scalar. Um. So for I so we I think it's very will be very similar. I don't know if that's um. Since we are, we only look at the all time. We only look at total rates, no. So never look at any um, particular distribution. So difference should come in this. But I mean, uh, I'm sure you can translate this into a coupling f gamma tilde. Where this is the coupling to ff tilde. This can be done probably very easily. Yeah, I guess. Uh, yeah, you're right. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I think there are no more questions. I hope you have enjoyed the webinar. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, of the webinar, and you can watch the webinar again. Uh, we'll have another one next week by Andreas Kudelis. And I hope to see you all soon in the next American Webinar on Physics. All right. Thanks for attending. <laughs>